lot of talking, so this is I do a lot of training. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass these guys around so you can see. You'll see some pictures in the uh, um, as we're talking about kind of like the roasting process. So I, I pulled these coffee beans out through the different um, through the different stages. So on the bottom in my really chicken scratch. Yes, I'm left-handed. Chicken scratch, left-handed handwriting. You'll see some initials. So G is for green. So that's what the that's what a raw coffee bean looks like, which is kind of neat. A lot of people don't know that. Um, D is for the end of the drying phase. We'll see. Uh, you'll see that process, and then the rest of it is just kind of progression. So this is middle of the first crack. This is after first crack, and then this is the the um, scary second crack, like I talked with you guys about earlier today. So you'll just kind of see how the how the process goes, and pay attention to a couple things. Like number one, the size of the bean. So it's kind of neat. That's how it starts, and that's how it ends. So it gets quite a bit bigger as you're uh, as you're doing the roasting process, and then of course the color. And then also if you flip if you flip the two C guy over, you'll see a bunch of uh, oil on the bottom of it. So it's kind of neat as that process goes, how, how that works. So it doesn't matter if they're in any order, but you'll figure it out color-wise. So there you go. I would not recommend eating them. I was really kidding. <laughs> so, huh? Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. yeah. Do whatever. I mean, we all have different learning. So if we've got, uh, if we've got some, you know, some, some sensory people, go right ahead. So, all right. So I guess I get to go ahead and get started. Everybody ready? Yeah. yeah. Right. Woo. Not at all. But no, good. So um, my name is uh, Tyler Brown. Um, I am with the uh, Daily Grand Coffee Co. I've been a uh, coffee roaster for, um, I guess it's going on about three years now. Um, roast out of my home. Started as a, started just kind of as a, as a, as a passion to have fresh, uh, have fresh, uh, have fresh coffee, have fresh air. Um, but that's me. Um, I, the, the, I guess the title for a coffee roaster is roast master, but I think what's kind of interesting about it is you never really master it. So, uh, just like a painter, um, a painter is never really truly a master painter. They just keep refining the craft. And so we're talking today about the science of coffee. Uh, but the interesting thing is it's a lot of art form as well too. So there's, there's art, there's science, and there's culinary magic that happens as well too. So that's what we're going to kind of talk through today and uh, um, hopefully uh, hopefully we learn a little something because I sure know I did whenever I put, uh, put the process together. So uh, let's turn this on and now it'll work. <laughs> Maybe. There we go. All right. So this is what coffee comes from. It comes from the coffee plant. Um, they can get to be two to eight meters tall so they can be pretty tall. Um, the plant has shiny waxy leaves. The red fruit is known as a cherry and inside each of the, the, the cherry are typically two coffee beans. Has anybody heard of the term pea berry before when it comes to coffee? So that is a, um, a unique um, uh, mutation I guess. So it just happens every now and then whenever there's only one coffee bean inside the plant. That's what they call pea berry. So, um, pea berry is a little bit different, but um, typically inside each cherry there's going to be two two coffee beans. It does take a year to grow. Uh, the plant takes about five years to reach maturity, um, and it can be productive for well, it can live as long as 100 years, which is uh, is pretty impressive, I think. Um, and the most productive years of the uh, of the coffee plant are between seven and 20 years. Um, it is from the how do we say that root? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, so it's from the Rubicea uh, family. There's 500 genus inside that family, 6,000 species of coffee. So this is really interesting to know. But there's only two that actually produces what we know as coffee. Um, and then two, the two different types, which a lot of people have heard about, is the Arabica or Arabica, and then also Robusta. So those are the two different types of uh, coffee that, uh, that, that comes from over 6,000 species, so we only know two of them. Um, so those are the two different uh, two different types, and we're going to talk through that a little bit. So the difference between um, Arabica and Robusta is, um, anybody heard those terms before? Arabica and Robusta? Arabica, yeah. Yep. Um, so the specialty coffee industry really comes from the Arabica side. So a long time ago, whenever coffee was coming out and people were starting to use it a lot more as, as, a, as a staple in the family. 
uh, it was the Robusta. So uh, most of the coffee that, that was produced in the world was, uh, was a Robusta plant. Um, so, and today you can see that only 40% of the, uh, of the coffee produced is, is Robusta because people are really starting to understand that the Arabica is a lot better. So uh, that's the specialty coffee side. There is actually less caffeine in the Arabica, which is kind of a bummer, but uh, there is a little bit less, ca uh, less caffeine. But look at the taste characteristics between the two. So with the Arabica you have a sweeter, smoother, um, you can get some chocolate, sugar, and some fruits and berries. And then this is the Robusta is what I call gas station coffee. Nothing yeah. wrong with gas station coffee because I, I, I disclose that I drink that as well too. I'm totally fine. Uh, but it's harsher, stronger, a little more bitter, um, not necessarily as good of a, uh, as good of a coffee cup. Um, it's less body, so it's a little bit of a thinner one where the Arabica can have a, a, a stronger or a, a, a thicker mouthfeel. Uh, like I said, 60% of the coffee production comes from the Arabica and only 40%. Um, but what is interesting about it is I want everybody to think, just rough estimate, how much coffee, how many pounds of coffee, do you buy coffee in pounds, do you buy by the tub, whatever, think about roughly how many pounds of coffee you would drink in a year. 15 pounds. 15 pounds, okay. More? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> the tub is what, a pound? Uh, depends. I mean, oh. are you shopping at Sam's? Or are you shopping talking about pounds of beans or pounds well, of brown? Yeah, same thing. Because I buy like two pounds of beans, okay. and then I might buy ground that the local store yeah. sometimes. Yeah. A couple little packs, you know. Yeah. So, so 15, I figure 15 total. Yeah. 15, 15, so 15 pounds a month. I can't really do the math for oh, a year. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. For a year. For a year. 15 pounds a year. Well, that's about one and a half. Maybe, maybe, yeah, uh, maybe. maybe. But what is really interesting about this is it takes, say, say our number is 15. It takes 15 plants to get that coffee. So you get one pound of coffee off of, uh, off of, uh, off of a plant. And that's pretty well it for the year. So Arabica can only be harvested once a year. They're gonna generate about a pound of, of coffee a year. So you know if we all had 15 pounds of coffee a year, we got 20, 15, 20 people in here. That's a lot of math. I can't do that. Yeah. It's more than 15. But you can imagine, and then just multiply that by the world, how many people are actually drinking coffee. You can kind of get an idea of how much coffee plants there need to be in order to, uh, to, to sustain us, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Robusta, on the other hand, is able to be harvested about three times a year. So um, from a whole supply and demand thing, you're going to see that your uh, Arabica coffee is more expensive because it, it harvests less often, and then your Robusta is going to be a little bit cheaper because you can harvest it more often. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's kind of a neat one. Um, the Robusta also grows a little bit better at lower altitudes and high humidity. Um, most coffee likes to be in, in elevated, uh, high elevations. Uh, so the Arabica likes to be in higher, higher elevations and uh, lower humidity process or uh, environments. So um, from a pollination size, or po from the pollination here, uh, your Arabica is going to uh, be able to be self-pollinated where the Robusta is self-sterile and it does require wind and other, you know, hummingbirds and, and bees to pollinate. So just some interesting stuff about that. Um, coffee belt, this is where it's at. This is where it came from, and this is where uh, where it's grown. And so I kind of find this to be pretty interesting. So you'll see that the tip of Florida is actually included in the in the uh, um, in the coffee belt. Um, there is um, in the contiguous United States, so the 48, the lower 48. Well, actually, we'll say all 40, 49, except for Hawaii. Hawaii is the only uh, um, United States or a state that can produce coffee. Um, so that's kind of interesting. There's nothing in North America, even though it says that uh, Florida could be part of it. So um, it all started um, smack in the middle in Ethiopia in the ninth century. So all coffee started from there. And I think there's probably a lot of other stuff that started from there as well. Too. Yeah. Uh, but all coffee started from there, uh, eventually became started to be traded uh, and uh, a sign of status if you had coffee. Uh, coffee plants and the, you know just like the spice roots and all of that stuff coffee started getting spread out all over the world uh, And then we found that it really doesn't grow anywhere outside of the uh, the coffee belt very well um, It can grow it actually just doesn't produce 
um, it won't actually produce a cherry, but it will grow a, grow a plant. All right, so now we know a little bit about coffee, and we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about what's called the the process. So after the plant has grown and created the cherry, um, it's still not quite coffee yet. Um, it goes through the the processing. So there's three different. There's a lot of different types, but these are the three main. There's three main different types: uh, the washed or the wet process, the natural process, and the the kind of the uh, middle of the road, the honey process. So in order to get the coffee bean out of the, the, the cherry, uh, this is what's called processing. So in order to process the, the bean out, you've got different ways. So the, the wash process um, uses water to separate the skin from the mucilage. And if you just think of your coffee bean as a cherry, I'm sorry, as a, as a grape, peel your grape, the stuff that's left underneath is, the, is what's called the mucilage. So if we can get the, the separate, or if we can get the skin off of the mucilage, we do that in different, different ways. Um, but right here with, their, the, with a water process or the wet process, we're using water to do that. And then we move from uh, the water tanks into fermentation tanks, uh, one to two days there. And then it can be either mechanically dried, literally in a giant um, uh, uh, drying machine, like a laundry dry, a tumble dryer, uh, or like a lot of people will see on the, on the patio beds or the raised beds, and that takes seven to 15 days. Um, what, what I noticed from this, and this is what I kind of challenge everybody to do, if you're getting into um, specialty coffee, pay attention to the types of processes that, you, that, you, uh, that you're getting, and then see if you can actually taste the coffee or the process. So with a wash process, you're going to get really clean flavors. Um, you'll, you'll really be able to identify the, the caramel and the sugary sweetness. Um, you'll get fruit acidity. Uh, and a bright, what's called a bright, crisp note. And I think you'll notice that whenever you taste the, the light roast today, it's pretty, it has a, a light flavor to it. Um, and it's kind of almost like effervescent on the tongue. So that's a wash process. Um, I would say just rough estimate, probably 60 to 70% of the coffee that we get is, is using the wash process. Um, it's expensive. So company or countries that don't have the means to do this are going to use one of the other two, the natural process or the honey process, as long as their climate is, is able to do it. So, and what I mean by that is whenever you go into the natural process, the fruit is dried first for 30 days. So if you got a dry season, it works. But if it rains a lot, where you're from, it doesn't work very well. So you might have to use a different process. But if it's dried first within 30 days, that fruit is fermenting on the coffee bean, and then you really taste the, the process of that. And whenever I open up a, a, a new bag of green beans, you saw that right there, uh, like an Ethiopian natural process, I'm immediately hit by wine. That's what, I, that's what I smell is wine. So that's what you'll get. So whenever you think wine, you think fruity, so you're gonna get a lot of fruity, uh, a lot of fruit, fruity flavors to it. Um, heavy, syrupy body is, that's what you'll notice with natural process. And the honey is just kind of in the middle. Uh, the honey process is where we get the, the skin out within a day, uh, but then you leave it to dry for 18 to 25 days. Um, same, same type, um, fruity, jammy flavors. Um, if, you're, if you know that you're near the end of your dry season, uh, maybe you'll be able to, to eke out a, a honey process, but you may not have enough time to do the full 30 day for the natural process. So um, the, the far two, the natural process is, is the cheapest um, because there's no water involved. Uh, the honey process is a little, more, a little bit more expensive, um, but, uh, but that's, the, that's what you'll typically see from, from different countries that have a little bit lesser means. So, um, and then the last process is what's called the civets process. I don't know if anybody's heard of this before. Um, has anybody heard of the $100 cup? Kofi Luwak? Huh? I heard about something. Like that one? <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, literally, these, these, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Literally, these, uh, these animals um, eat. It's a little, you know, it's a little cat of some type. Uh, they eat the coffee, and they it, it ferments in their system, and then we walk around and we scoop it up. So the, the, the flavor characteristics of this is. Uh, yeah. It's coffee that tastes a lot like shh. Uh, so moving on to the <laughs> coffee roasting timeline. So how do we figure this out? So has anybody heard of kind of like the origin of coffee? Has anybody heard of the name Caldies? 
Call, yeah, Caldi's, Caldi's Coffee. Caldi's Coffee. Yeah, Caldi's, Caldi's Coffee. Coffee. That's kind of where where the the idea of coffee came from. I think it's kind of a myth, but there was a there was a goat herder somewhere that noticed that his goats were were getting pretty worked up after eating some plants, and that was where the idea of coffee came from. Was was from Caldi. So if you'll see Caldi, if you'll see the name, I think it's a myth, um, but. Um, ninth century in the uh, in Ethiopia is really where coffee came from, but there's a big step between the ninth century and the fifteenth century, which is when it first was starting to be roasted. So coffee was originally kind of prepared as a tea, um, and now now we started to roast it, grind it, and then pour water over top of it. So in the fifteenth century, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, we start to see that they're roasting the the coffee beans in a big metal pan with a uh, uh, with a spoon to stir it. Um, then we move into 1650 where you see Cairo, the coffee roasting cylinder with a crank. Um, you'll hear me talk in a minute about drum roasters. So this is kind of where the drum roaster originally came from. Um, so it's just sitting over top of a, a fire and somebody's, somebody's uh, turning it um, in, in a circle. And then 1849, big difference between 1650 and 1849. That's when the spherical roaster um, came out and that's where coffee started actually being made in the home. So the spherical roaster could be fit over top of a, of a uh, um, wood-burning fireplace or a, a, a wood stove. And then we move into the 20th century. So the, right at the turn of the 20th century, this is where we start to see electric roasters um, originating. It's a, it's a coin toss, but I'm going to say Germany is where they started from. U.S. was hot on its heels. So, um, and this is the, t the different types of coffee. There's a bunch of different ones, but these are kind of the big ones. These are the big ideas. Uh, these are the different types of coffee roasters. The, one, the picture on the left that says topper is what's known as a hot air or airflow roaster or a fluid bed roaster. So that's, uh, um, that's that one there. And the picture on the right is actually my roaster, um, but not in my house. <laughs> um, and that's, a, that's what we call a drum roaster. And we'll go through that a little bit. Um, so, as I was doing the, the, putting this together, I realized the title is Science of Coffee Roasting, and I hadn't really included any science, so art history. So, let's talk science. Um, three different ways of heat transfer, radiation, conduction, and convection. Radiation is uh, heating through electromagnetic, uh, excuse me, electromagnetic waves like the sun. Um, conduction is one molecule uh, to another with uh, direct contact, um, and that's like frying an egg or putting your hand on a hot stove. And then convection is movement of heat through a liquid or a gas. So think of a blow dryer. So that's kind of the, the, the different ways. What do you think would be my way of, of heating in the drum roaster? Convection. Yeah, and what else? So convection for sure, yep, convection for sure, and then conduction. The, the, the roaster is made of, of stainless steel and cast iron. Um, that has heating property as well too, so there's some conduction and convection. And if the beans were dried in the sun prior, there's all three. Electromagnetic, yeah, yeah, very good. So you can have all three. So here's the heat transfer during roasting, and I chuckled. I see this on the, so these are actually, <clears throat> Not even <laughs> coffee beans. Picture, I'm like, oh, that looks like a cool picture, and I look at it. That is not coffee. <laughs> so, full uh, full disclosure. I think it's chocolate. <laughs> no one would have ever known. <laughs> All right. Um, so the heat transfer during roasting. Uh, this is how it happens: conduction and convection. You're right. Uh, contact of the bean to the drum, especially if the drum is moving slow. Um, Contact of the bean to bean during an exothermic phase. So whenever the bean starts to give off heat and it touches another bean, um, that's conduction as well. Um, changes happen from the outside in with conduction. And this is kind of important to know because if you have too much conductive heat transfer, you can burn the bean and not actually roast it. So um, you may think that you have a really good roast, uh, but it'll still be green or raw on the inside. Um, convection, uh, heat transfer by airflow in the roasting drum. Uh, convection increases as the beans dry in my drum roaster, uh, which then kind of allows them to float. And I've got a video of, uh, of a uh, roast here, then you can see that, I'll point that out. Um, but neat, what's neat to see with convection is that um, the, the cooking happens, or the roasting, if you will, happens from the inside out. 
Um, so you can uh, you can get a better, you know, a much better, more consistent roast with convection. But too much convection, um, so like one of those airflow roasters um, that is all convection, um, will really I think gives a flat cup coffee. Uh, will mute the acidity of the coffee and the acidity. You'll hear me say this a bunch today. Um, acidity is not necessarily um, stomach acid or, or reflux or anything. It's it's the it's the bright feeling on your tongue. It's a it's a light feeling. So that's usually uh, something that people want to try to maintain if possible. So convection will mute that as uh, as uh, if that's the primary source of heat transfer. Um, so heat transfer by roaster type. We've kind of already talked about that. The one on the left is primarily convection. Uh, drum roaster is going to be 70-30. Um, 70 percent convection 30 percent conduction so what can i as the coffee roaster control it's these four things how much heat am i dumping in how much airflow am i pushing through um, how, what what speed is the drum turning and then how long do i let the coffee go so those are the four variables that i'm working through um, any one of those adjustments can be a major change in the outcome so if I have too much airflow, um, the coffee may roast way too quickly. If I don't have enough heat, it may bake. If, uh, if the drum speed is going too slow, I might have too much conduction and then I'll have under roasted coffee. So um, we have to pay attention to a lot of that stuff. And uh, of course, if I let it go too long, um, it gets dark. So um, these are the stages uh, and we'll go through each one of these. Uh, charge soak, turning point, dry to green or green to yellow, yellow to first crack development, second crack, and the drop. So we'll go through those in a minute. Um, how's everybody doing? Anybody falling asleep yet? <laughs> no, not me. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. So back to my fantastic chocolate picture again. Uh, roast, <laughs> so the roast stages, the charge, I just think it's kind of cool, um, but that's the name of just dropping the beans into the drum. So it all starts in the big funnel that's on top of my coffee roaster. I push a slide. And then the beans go down into the into the into the roasting environment. That's what we call a charge. Um, I don't even consider that a stage, but it is the beginning of the roast. So I guess you got to call it that. And then the next is the soak. So um, I use a, uh, a program called Artisan, which helps me monitor all of the roasts on my computer. And it gives me curves and temperatures and all of that stuff. And it seems to be kind of counterintuitive that as I dump the coffee in, my temperature drops. It doesn't seem, but what's going on is that the environment, the roasting environment, is giving the, the heat to the beans. So the beans are really soaking up the heat. Uh, beans drop in the roasting drum, begin to take on the, the heat of the roasting environment. Um, that's all passive heat. I don't have any heat added at this point in time. Um, and it typically lasts 45 seconds to a minute. Um, a lot of things can change in that period of time. So how hot do I have the environment when I drop the beans in? Um, that's very dependent on the, the density of the bean that I get. Um, if it's a low density bean, I can't have them soak too long because the roasting process starts right away. If it's a super dense bean, probably need to drop them in and let them soak for about a minute and a half instead. But on average, 45 seconds to a minute. Is the drum turning then? Drum is turning, yeah, yep. The drum is turning. Yep. Um, then the next one is uh, the turning point or the equilibrium. This is when the, the environment has given off all of its heat and the beans have taken all they want to and I turn the heat on and now all of my numbers start going back up again. So this is the point of equilibrium. So the bean temp goes up, the roaster temp goes down. I turn on the energy source. Um, and uh, like I said, the turning point is the point at which the roasting environment is no longer losing heat and starts to gain. Uh, typically takes about two minutes after the charge and soak depending on several things. Charge temperature, duration of the soak, and how aggressive I get with turning my heat on. So if I crank it up, uh, turning point's going to come a little bit quicker. Uh, every bean's a little bit different, but I would say on average 150 to 160 degrees is, uh, is an average turning point. And then we go into the drying phase. Um, and you guys saw the picture, or the, the beans, right? So they go in as green, and then that's the drying phase. So they've turned green to, to yellow, so that's why I call it the green to yellow phase. Um, and from a science perspective, 
um, what is happening is the, the water content is being driven off and chlorophyll is going away, right? So it's no longer green. Yeah? Okay. Um, whenever I get that, so the, the water content, if you will, of this bean here is probably about 11%. And uh, by the time it reaches uh, the drying phase, it's about 5%. So that's, what, uh, that's what's going on in this area. Um, what happens there, not a whole lot of chemical changes happen, uh, but what happens is I start to notice an aroma of toast or bread. So once I start to notice that, I know that the, the coffee is just about dry and ready to move into the next phase. Um, the, uh, this will be about half of the roasting time. So um, it doesn't matter how fast or how slow it takes to dry. So you want to get it done as quick as you possibly can so that the rest of the stuff uh, can work out as well. So about, it takes to, up to about 300 degrees and it'll be about half of my roasting phase. This is all endothermic, which means the coffee has taken on all the heat that it possibly can. And then we get into the uh, uh, yellow to first crack uh, phase. Uh, this is what's called the Maillard phase. Uh, has anybody heard of Maillard before? Has anybody ever browned meat before? So that's Maillard. Um, the, the browning phase is, uh, um, is what's called the Maillard phase. And what, what's happening inside the bean is the amino acids are starting to react with the sugar in the, inside the bean, and then it produces volatile compounds. I'll play a video, I don't know, or I'll play a sound. I don't know if the radio is going to pick up or not, or it might even play on the TV here, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but the, the sound is called first crack. Uh, first crack is the first auditory um, feedback that I get that I'm on the right process. So it sounds like popcorn. Um, and then whenever it does go into first crack, it now becomes exothermic. So the coffee starts actually giving off heat um, instead, of, in, instead of taking it on. So let's play the, play the sound here if I can and see where it comes from. starting to expand a little bit um, and that's the that's what's happening is those volatile compounds are kind of building up inside the bean and then it causes the bean to expand and then the pop is typically that that being uh, released and then the silver skin or the chaff starts to be blown off mm -hmm. um, caramelization um, is whenever the water is driven off um, initially you will smell that it's sweet uh, and then what happens is it becomes kind of a sour smell or a sour smell. So um, we were talking about it earlier today, like there's some roasters that are dropping right off at, uh, at the end of first crack or in the middle of first crack. Um, I don't like it at all. It's, a, it's kind of a, a bitter flavor, um, but I don't like that at all, but some people do. Uh, the beans do begin to give off the CO2 at that time. And then we move into the, we move into the development phase, which is where uh, to me, this is kind of where the magic happens. So the longer do you leave something in the development phase, um, there's more chemical reactions that are happening. Um, and I think this is the part where the most impact is, is had on the flavor of the coffee. So um, if you pull something out too soon, it won't go through to the sweetness again. So it starts off as sweet, and then it becomes bitter. And then what happens is it will start to become sweet again because all of the, the sugar compounds are starting to break up. And then now you've got a bunch of kind of loose sugar that joins together. And then that becomes new sugar molecules. So that's where that sweetness comes from. This again is an endothermic process. Um, and, and this is kind of the first stage where roasting all of a sudden is, is more convective. So now that the beans are lighter, they're continuously getting lighter. So they're going to start floating a little bit more. Still at 300? No. So um, we're we're north at 300. Um, usually, well, it depends on first crack. So after first crack, um, we might be 420, mm -hmm. 425. And your your software will manage the temperature. So I'm doing all of the oh, little tweaking. tweaks. Yeah, oh. I'm watching to make sure that it that it's that it's <laughs> rolling a pretty pretty smooth way so if my if my curve is spiked if it's too hot and it's rolling too fast it's kind of like trying to stop a brake train it just doesn't work very well 
So I like to try to keep it at a, at a smooth pace so that I can, little adjustments will have a big, uh, big impact on it. So that's development phase. Uh, then we can get into second crack. I don't get here unless it's an accident, typically. <laughs> so uh, second crack is uh, the second exothermic reaction of the bean. Um, again, it's going to be another, uh, you, you start to hear the bean structure fracture. Uh, and this is pure, almost purely convective at this point. But here's the sound of the second crack. And I'll point out some differences. So um, the first difference is this is a longer. Uh, Audio track, I guess. <laughs> the first difference is it's a little higher, uh, higher pitch. Uh, the the first crack is a, low, a little bit more of a lower pitch. Um, sounds the first crack to me sounds like popcorn. Second crack to me sounds like Rice Krispies with uh, with um, milk on it. So um, that is second crack, and then uh, then we get into the drop, um, and that's just whenever we we pull the beans out of the roasting environment into my uh, into my cooling tray. Um, the idea is that we have a, a high power fan and a mechanical arm that, that cools off the, the beans within, to room temperature within two minutes. So you know if you make a lasagna and pull it out and you put it on your, uh, on your, on your stove top, it kind of keeps cooking for a while. Uh, the idea is to stop the roast as soon as you want to stop the roast because those chemical reactions can continue. So if you, dry, if you pull your, your coffee out in an exothermic, especially in an exothermic phase, um, it will continue to heat and cook, and, and uh, it's not only great, it'll, it'll taste flat or baked. So um, that is the, that's the drop. Um, and you kind of saw the, the, the bean size. The beans approximately doubled and lost about 20% of its original weight. So this is kind of a, um, an interesting, uh, whenever you buy coffee, how do you buy it? Like if it's in a bag, do you buy it by the pound? Okay. Look at your bag again. 12 ounces, 14 ounces typically, right? Um, do you think the coffee roaster buys it by the pound? Yes. Yeah, well, coffee roaster actually probably buys, buys it by the kilo, but right. <laughs> like myself, yeah. My UPS guy loves me. Um, but the, the reason for that is if you put 16 ounces of coffee in your roast, you're probably gonna end up with 20% less or 25% less. So that's the reason why you buy it in 12 to 14 ounce packages. So they start with a pound and then it ends with 14 or 12, 12 or 14 ounces. Um, and then let's go through let's go through uh, the, what the roast levels look like, and then that's about all I got. Oh, I got a little video at the end. Um, roast levels. So a light city, half city, or a cinnamon roast. Um, I will never roast to this level because again, I think that this is well. I, I roast to this level, but I roast through this level. Um, I think it has a bitter flavor to it. Um, light roast is kind of, it's starting to become more popular in the specialty coffee industry. Um, pretty potent flavors for sure. Um, and then what I would be looking or listening to if I was going to drop a roast in, at, at Light City would be to stop the roast whenever the first crack is really going strong. So kind of like the video or the, the sound that I played for you, uh, rolling pretty strong, that's whenever I drop it. The next one is called a city roast. Uh, city roast is generally considered to be a light roast. This is typically the lightest that I'll stop my coffee roast. Uh, you maintain the beans natural flavor characteristics. So, excuse me, if it came from Ethiopia, it's probably going to have a little bit of a, 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 um, a fruity flavor to it. Uh, the longer that I roast, the more you taste the roasting process. So just think of throwing a steak on the grill. Uh, if, if you roast it longer and longer and longer, it doesn't matter if it's a ribeye or a filet or a porterhouse. If you roast it a long time, it's probably going to taste the same. You know, it's going to get, it's going to wind up tasting about the same no matter what. Um, so we like to try to maintain as much of the, the natural flavor characteristics as you can. Um, what I'm listening for, for on the on the roast is stop roast as the first crack is just finishing. So there might still be some pops going on. City Plus roast, uh, lighter medium roast. Um, the, what I'm list, listening for is to drop the roast after first crack is completed. So I don't, I'm not hearing any more pops. I'm going to drop it. And this is a pretty good flavor, uh, pretty good flavor for a roast. Uh, full city roast. So these, the, the, the city, 
City Plus, Full City Roast is usually where I, I, I stop my roasts. Um, on the Full City Roast, you're just on the verge of, of second crack getting ready to happen. Um, it is a, considered a medium roast, and I think this is where you start to get a good balance in between what the bean should taste like and what your roasting process actually imparts on the bean. Uh, roaster cues, what I'm listening for is first crack is completed. Um, I'm watching for the beginning of the exothermic, so I'm going to see a spike in, the, in, the, in my um, temperature ratings, even though I haven't added any more heat. So that's kind of a neat thing to see. And then we jump into Full City Plus, so second crack is just starting. Um, I think you can have normal flavor characteristics here, uh, but you're, again, you're starting to taste the roast itself. Um, so as soon as I'm hearing second crack start, I'm dropping it. Uh, and then we get into Vienna. You guys have heard of the Vienna roast before? Mm -hmm. This is uncharted territory for me. Like, I won't ever get there. Uh, so a Vienna roast uh, is a rolling second crack. Uh, this, is a, this is a considered a dark roast. Um, that is, so that last cup that you saw is actually a, what I would call my Vienna roast. Um, that was, I dropped it in, in, the, in the middle of second crack just, just because I wanted to, but not because I wanted to drink it. Uh, but what I'm listening for is um, once that, that second crack is in full swing, that's whenever I'm getting ready to drop it. And then we get into uh, uh, French roast. Who likes French roast? Yeah, really, I mean, I do. Hey, I do, I, um, I do as well too. Uh, French roast is a dark roast, um, and, and this is, you know, people like this flavor. Um, it's, it's kind of a burnt, smoky flavor, right? I mean, I like, I like that as well. Um, but the reason why I don't roast at this level um, is just because it's very hard to control. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it became, and the next, I'll show you the next slide is what's called Spanish roast. Uh, but here, here um, what's happening is it's just carbon, carbonization. So the bean has really started to carbonize. Um, and what happens is pretty much all dark roasts start to taste the same. So it doesn't matter what bean you got, um, but it, you roast it longer, it's going to taste the same as, you know, right. as something else. So uh, roasters, especially larger commercial roasters, will use um, the dark roast, like a French roast, um, as kind of a filler. If they have some cheaper beans that maybe aren't all that great quality, whenever they roasted it out and cupped it, they're like, oh, that's not very good. Let's burn it. Yeah. <laughs> so they do. Uh, and then they add it in. So, um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it gives a thin body in the cup, um, not a whole lot of smell to it. The taste of it is all fairly same as well, too. Um, what I'm listening for, stop the roast, is the second crack is tailing off. And then we get into the Italian or the Spanish roast, fully carbonized. You're literally drinking charcoal, 25% of it's ash. Um, so, I mean, that, that's, that is what it is. Um, but the reason why, why I won't do this is because I don't have a great fire suppression system, um, fire, fire is imminent, um, beans will um, uh, catch fire whenever you drop them into the sudden rush of oxygen out of the, out of the area and they'll combust. So I'm not, I'm not all for that. Do people ever drink this? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I mean, you've heard of Italian roast probably before. Yeah, I hadn't really heard much of the Spanish roast, but um, I'm guessing that that's the way the Italians and Spanish, maybe like India. Where did the oil come from? What, what is involved with this? Why? So this is even my dad, and he's asking me the hard <laughs> questions. You're supposed to ask easy questions. Yeah. So, no, so as the as the roasting process is happening, all of the all of the chemical reactions that are that are that are going on inside um, are things are breaking down and, and joining together back again, and then the oil is expressed through. Now the outside of the bean is pretty porous, and now the, the oil is able to, 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 to leak through. So the oil's there, um, it just w wasn't able to get out. The longer that you roast it, the more porous that bean is, so that it's able to come out. But with like flavored coffees, then do they add an oil yeah. to it yep. that smells yep. like whatever? Yep. Um, so, uh, Yes, adding flavor um, after the bean is it has been roasted, typically cool down pretty decent, um, then you can add in. Sometimes it's alcohol based, sometimes it's oil based. So, yep, adds it back in. So then that's really, this is all on the exterior of the, of the coffee bean. 
All right, so far so good? So start to finish, typical roast time? Um, 15 minutes. Oh, real fast. Yep. There's a lot of stuff that happens, and you gotta be. You're there so, watching it. Yeah, you gotta pay attention. So you started a pound? Do what? Do you start at one pound per roast? Um, so I roast, I have a 6K roaster, so I roast uh, uh, six kilograms at a time, so. Four, what is it, 13, 14 pounds at a time? Oh, okay. okay. Yep. Um, yeah, good question. And, and what is interesting is uh, all your roasters are a little bit different. So I can actually roast at 100%. Uh, it's a 6K roaster, so I can roast at 100% load. Uh, some will say it's a 6K roaster, but you should only roast at 4,800 grams, you know, or kilograms. So um, not 4,800 kilograms, 4,800 grams. There you go. Uh, so you, it all depends on the type of machine. But yeah, that's what we start with. So I'm dropping, I usually do 10 to 12 pounds uh, on the, on the, on the finished product side. All right, so if you've been to coffee shops before and they have a bunch of different flavors out there, or not flavors, but type, types of beans, do you get over, yeah, do you get overwhelmed like I did? Yeah, yeah. because I don't know what they're gonna taste like. Exactly, so that's why I put this slide up there. <laughs> um, I, so I find myself, I just, you know, a lot of, so the coffee is the same thing. It's the same plant, it's just grown in a different area. So just think of corn. If corn grown in Illinois tasted the same as corn grown in California, it really probably does because it's horribly genetically modified, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's basically what it is. So the coffee plant is gonna take on the, the characteristics of the, of the dirt in which it's grown. And the air. Yeah, and the air and the, how much sun is coming and yeah, what's pollinating it, what's around and all of that. So there's a lot of variables to it. Like uh, how you think of pun. Yep, you bet. Yep, you bet. So this is what, this is, if you were to kind of try to boil it down to, if you look at South America, South America um, is going to be a well-balanced, kind of a low acidity. Um, you may be able to get some notes of chocolate, nuts, and caramel out of it. Uh, Central America, which is what I really like. Uh, Central Americas are bright, clean. Uh, they are a little bit less sweet than South American, uh, but you'll still get the same, same kind of uh, flavors, but we're going to add in a little bit more fruit. Um, then we get into Africa, um, more full body, um, naturally sweet. It's going to have a pretty good acidity, and then you're going to start to notice a spice to it. So, um, and then you can also get um, exotic fruit and floral uh, flavors from that. And then if we move over to Asia, Pacific Islands, um, just think volcanoes. So mm -hmm. think robust, kind of smoky, um, earthy flavors is what you're going to get. Herbal notes, complex herbal notes. So that'll kind of give you an idea if you're looking at something, hey, I'm looking at a Vietnam, okay, well, where's Vietnam? Um, and then maybe I'm looking at a Colombia, where's Colombia? Maybe I'm looking at Ethiopia. Okay, this will kind of give me an idea of maybe what that's gonna taste like. Or maybe think, oh, I don't know, Central America sounds pretty good, so do you have anything from you know Central America? And then start there. But you'll see in a, in a couple, you know, this slide here, there's a ton of different flavors, so um, if you're looking at cupping and if you're looking at the, the flavor profiles that the professional guys, my palate is not this defined. I cannot taste pea pod <laughs> in coffee, um, but you can start to see just with the colors, you know, you can kind of, you know, fruits are red, you can kind of taste red. I mean, it sounds weird but you can kind of taste red, you can kind of taste yellow, that's a little bit more sour, green grassy type stuff, you can think vegetation, uh, you can start to see these things. And, and if you see a specific one, like Ethiopia, you've heard me mention it a, a bunch, um, Ethiopia, especially if you get a good one, and if it's a natural process, you're gonna get, you're literally gonna taste like you're drinking blueberry, a wow. cup of blueberry coffee, and it's not flavored, it's just the natural flavor of the coffee. It's but amazing. that's where the bean. Yeah. Start. But yep. you could mess that up by the process. Oh yeah, that, my job is not getting away. <laughs> yeah, my job is to make sure that, uh, that I don't screw it up. So Ethiopia, you'll have the berry flavors. Kenya, um, I, I noticed the red flavors with those. So the cranberry, raspberry, redwood flowers. Um, Peru stuff, you get into what's called the stone fruit. So peach and cherry, apricot, you can start to notice that. Uh, Colombia, which, you know, whenever people think of coffee, they think of typically just a cup of Colombian coffee. And this is the reason why, because we like chocolate. So bittersweet chocolate, caramel flavors, you can maybe get a little bit of citrus orange out of it, but not, to me, not a whole lot. 
PNG or Papua New Guinea, tropical fruit, citrus, molasses. So those are those are just some kind of typical flavor profiles that you can get from uh, from coffee. Cool. All right. Have put anybody asleep yet? Yeah. All right. So here's here is uh, this is the roast process. So that's the charge. I just drop the drop the beans in. Um, turning the gas on and you can kind of see in the little window up here that the coffee beans are green right now. Uh, here in a second you'll see that they at the end of the drying phase that now they're tan. And can you hear a difference too? Kind of a like a little more, it's a little more subtle. So we're starting to get some convection in here. Originally it was just contacting the drum. But now we're starting to get the beans are starting to float a little bit. So are your beans turning out even if you have the same Ethiopian coffee? Are you get, are you pretty consistent or do you have a hard yeah? Yeah, I'm, I'm get I'm getting better. This is where I said the science. Science and art form. Now you can hear my rolling first crack. So now the beans are a little a little more brown. And just for you guys. see the difference in flavors and I think you'll notice a pretty big flavor um, difference. So with the light roast, um, I think the first thing that hits me whenever I have the light roast is um, it just feels kind of bright. It's almost zingy on the tongue. Um, so that's the acidity. Uh, the dark roast, um, I get a lot more chocolate out of. Mm -hmm. So pretty neat. Uh, and then you can also kind of start to feel the or taste the, the, um, the, uh, the, the smoky flavor that goes along with it. So the Sumatra bean is one of the ones that I will go a little bit darker with because I know the bean can handle it. Um, it's, a, it's a very high dense, uh, um, high water content bean so I can roast it a little bit longer. So um, that's it for my part. What, what are the flavors you're looking for in the Sumatra bean as far as your chart? Yeah. So um, with uh, with the Sumatra, I think what you're gonna what what it, it takes a little bit of time, and actually I think it tastes better or it's easier to taste whenever the coffee's cooler. So do some and try some warm and then get an extra cup and let it sit for a little bit and then try it as it cools off and you'll you'll start to notice the flavors a little bit better. Um, so this one with the light one, you'll the biggest thing that I notice is the is the acidity, so how how lively it is on the tongue. Uh, with the darker one, you can pick up the smoke, uh, you can pick up the smoky flavor, uh, and then you can the goal is to get kind of an earthy um, um, an earthy flavor out of it. So you'll get, yeah, you'll get chocolate. Um, you'll get like usually bitter chocolate, uh, bittersweet chocolate out of it. Is the best way to look for these flavors without cream and sugar or just black? Yeah, so my, my whole thing about coffee is coffee is highly personal. So, you know, there's, there's you know, nobody has the best way to, to drink it. Um, Whenever you're wanting to pick up the flavor characteristics, um, it's best to try it black to get the taste of it. But I wouldn't suggest just drinking black coffee all the time. I mean, I'm 50-50 myself at home. I might have a little cream and sugar uh, at work. I'll pour a cup of black. It just all depends on how busy I am. So, um, but yeah, in order to really taste the flavors of it, um, the, the try black. And I think you'd be surprised. A lot of people are like, oh, I hate black coffee because it's, <laughs> 
I think you'd be surprised. If you have good black coffee, there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was looking at the flavor chart. I'm really interested in the cardboard coffee. Yeah. Where do you yeah. think I find that? Yeah. yeah. So um, that's actually what that rose tasted like. So, um, <laughs> I let, so it okay. baked. Um, it baked too long because I wasn't able to cool it off. Um, it wound up tasting like cardboard. Yeah, I was looking at the wheel and it was like fruity and then it starts getting into cardboard and <laughs> wood and then paper. Yep. Yep. And yep. Stuff. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's funny. Uh, but yeah, you can. You can taste it. And what's the crazy part is some people actually try to roast for that. You know, like, oh yeah, I've got cardboard <laughs> coffee. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's what a real man has. I, exactly. I try to avoid that. So, yeah, good Where stuff. do you source your beans? Um, anywhere. So, um, I, I work with uh, the company is called La Bodega. Um, they um, they also have Sweet uh, Sweet Maria's and then uh, Coffee Shrub. It's all kind of the same. Cafe Imports, uh, places from Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, and they import from wherever they can get it whenever it's in season. So coffee is an agricultural product. So like right now, I cannot get something from Kenya. Uh, because the season's already, it hasn't started yet for them. So, um, but I work with uh, Cafe Imports, but there's a lot of different import uh, companies around. Um, I like Cafe Imports because they give me a lot of information that I want to know. So I want to know what the cupping score is. Uh, a good cup of coffee is going to be 86, um, 80 or above, really. Um, some, some, there's a coffee importer in St. Louis. Um, and he's a little bit cheaper uh, for me to use, but can't give me any information, so I don't, I don't want to. What do does that. that mean? What you just said, cupping score. So the cupping score, um, we'll we'll look at the the um, that wheel, uh, and obviously cardboard is not a, a desirable, yeah, a, a desirable uh, uh, thing. So the the coffee tasters will um, grade uh, that coffee as a, whenever they cup it out. Per that batch of beans from that specific place, or so um, they. So whenever you cup, uh, not whenever you cup, but whenever you roast for cupping scores, it's the exact same type of uh, uh, same type of a roast. So they're going to do a very light. So that's actually the the half half city, yeah. I think, or the the cinnamon roast. Uh, so they can they can get a good idea of what that coffee just naturally tastes like. Uh, they want to try to make sure that everything is, is, is you know, even keel as possible, control all the variables. So they'll stick it in a machine at 300 degrees for 15 minutes with no airflow or something like that. And that's how they're, that's how they roast it out. If we buy coffee already packaged from bean or even mm -hmm. the ground, how, and sometimes it tells you the country of origin, mm -hmm. but that's, I don't know if there's other information. I've never really looked. Well, um, so like, uh, what like, might we? For. Like yeah. some of this, some of the things that, like, uh, for Sorry, you know, you guys just want to drink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you guys just want to get up and drink coffee. So, like, the, I think probably the most important stuff number one is where it's from. So, um, this is Sumatra. The next most important thing is the roast date. Um, so, the roast date, this is 324. Um, so, that's pretty, pretty fresh. Um, that's, I would say those are probably your biggest, uh, your biggest things. And then the rest of it comes to just how you like it. Try it. Cupping score really doesn't matter a whole lot. So what, what this guy over here says is an 86, you may dump. Yeah, it's terrible. So it all comes down in what you what your flavor um, Can you spare your beans you like. by putting them in the refrigerator or freezer? So, um, no. Um, the, the, the enemies, the two enemies of coffee are light and so, yep, so if you, I'm sorry, light and air, uh, heat you can throw in there as well too, but the light and air are the two biggest ones. Uh, so if you just keep it in, a, in a, a sealed container that doesn't let light in and you keep it at room temperature, it'll, it'll keep for a while. Yep. Um, put in a, you know, a lot of people freeze them. Um, I think it just makes it bean brittle whenever you go to, go to, uh, go to roast it. Oh, I'm sorry, to, to grind it, yep. And what, so you bring up, a, that's another point. Um, if you take nothing out else from, you know, from this, it's get a, get whole bean coffee and get a roaster. So, or I'm a sorry, grinder. a grinder, my goodness. 
on video, too. We need a roaster. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you, you know, the, the statistic is you lose 40% of the freshness of your coffee as soon as you grind it. So, if I grind this whole bag, um, and then you're like, hey, I spent 15 bucks on this bag of coffee. It's good coffee. I'm going to nurse it. You know, I'm not going to... I'm not gonna brew it just like normal. I'm gonna nurse it along a little bit, so then this, this bag of coffee winds up lasting two months or something. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna taste the same at all. So coffee does, they say coffee does peak. Um, I, I won't drink any coffee that I roast uh, for at least 48 hours because it's off gassing. It, you know, this bag will actually puff up and all of that because it's letting off gas. Uh, so I let it sit for a good two days before I'll try it, which is really tough because you wanna know, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you want to know, and hey, should I do this roast again or not? Mm -hmm. um, you got to wait two days, um, and then grinding it just right before you, right before you drink it, is the best. You're probably, you guys probably talk about that though. Anyway. Yeah, we do. Yeah. My bad. Well, you're fine. You're yeah. just stealing our thunder. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get coffee. Huh? Let's yeah, get coffee. get coffee. Do you guys got want to sit up? Yep. <laughs> well, I'm Taylor, I'm Erica, and we um, just opened Rooted Coffee downtown. I, I've seen a lot of your guys' faces, so I'm sure you know who we are, but um, we just opened like seven months ago. It, um, we met in college, actually. We both went to Mizzou, and it was our dream to open a coffee shop. And I honestly didn't think it would happen this early in life, but things just kept falling into place, so like I just know it was meant to be. And then I'll get emotional if I talk too much about it. But like <laughs> honestly, like we really are living our dream every day, which is crazy and crazy. And we have you guys to thank for that. So I want to start by saying thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Here in this little town, the community is great. Yeah, we just really, really appreciate you guys' support. But so now we're gonna go to the second part of coffee. You know, you have Tyler who does the roasting process, but how do you now consume it? You're not going to eat the bean. You're not going to drink the bean. So let's get into that. We're going to tell you how to have the perfect cup. We think the perfect cup of coffee has three components. And it's the brew, the setting, and the company. So there's quite a few ways, actually, that you can brew coffee. These are just some of the more popular ones. You have your classic drip coffee, which is probably what most of you are familiar with. Most of you probably maybe have a Keurig at home or some way that you brew some Folgers in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, next to the pour over coffee is going to give you actually a similar taste to a drip coffee, but it is made to a single cup. So it's going to be a little bit higher quality just because you're just making one single quantity. Mm -hmm. um, then you have an espresso shot or an AeroPress, which is typically what you'll find in a cappuccino or a latte. Originally, actually, people did just take shots of espresso. You'll find, like, in Europe, actually, it's really common to have them at dinner time with your dessert. Um, and they are made from a lot of pressure and a lot of heat. Um, and then you have cold brew, which is a very long brewed process. It's brewed in cold water, and for a very long time, it gives you your smoothest option if you like iced drinks. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. my personal favorite. Actually. You will find all of those at like any any yeah. coffee shop too. Okay, so this is going to be Tyler touched on this a little bit. He stole our thunder, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the most important part, I think, in the brewing process is grind and the grind size for each cup of coffee that you're trying to get. Because like Tyler tries to do in his roasting process, you wanna keep all of those original flavor profiles, right? So like if you're getting it from Ethiopia, you want those flavor profiles. If you're getting it from Colombia, you want those flavor profiles. And that all comes from the grind size. So if you think about, think about like a cup of sand versus a cup of, you know, pebbles. If you pour water over a cup of sand, it's gonna take a lot longer for that water to go through the sand than if you were to pour water over a cup of pebbles. It would go through a little bit quicker, right? So it's the same thing as when you're grinding coffee. So like a classic, you know, drip coffee, like a coffee pot at home or a Keurig, um, you want it to be like in between the sand and the pebbles because you want it to have that hot water to go over those, you know, those grounds at a nice speed that it you know, extracts the flavor notes well 
and also the caffeine will. And that's the same thing with pour over coffee as well. It's, it's kind of the same amount of, you know, the grind size. Now when you get into an espresso or an AeroPress shot, which is what we do at the coffee shop, if you think about it, you have a cup of coffee, like, you know, you drink a cup of coffee, it's like this much coffee, right? An espresso shot is like this much coffee. So you want like this much coffee to be a lot more like condensed and to have a lot more of that flavor profile and caffeine than this much coffee, right? Because if you're drinking a latte, you have like this much espresso and this much milk, mm -hmm. you know, you still want to be able to taste the coffee, get the caffeine, still have that flavor profile. So that's why the grind size <coughs> on an espresso shot is going to be a lot finer because you want the water to seep through it a lot slower to extract everything and have like a sh almost a stronger cup of coffee. And then with cold brew, um, I, I doubt a lot of you will make cold brew because it is, it's a whole process. It actually brews for up to 24 hours. So it has to be really coarse because you don't want it to be really fine, then it would be like crazy strong. It would just, it would be really acidic, all that kind of stuff. Um, so cold brew, brewing up for 24 hours in cold water actually gives it that really smooth <coughs> flavor. And then we thought you guys would be interested in just how to learn um, how to make like a, a little bit fancier cup of coffee at home mm -hmm. than just your typical drink. So we wanted to just talk through how you make a pour over. Again, it's going to taste similar to your drip, but with anything in life, when you make things in larger quantities, you lose a little bit of the quality. And so a pour over is just going to be a little bit higher quality cup of coffee at home. It's really fun to like make when you have a little more time in the mm -hmm. morning or you're staying home. Um, and so you'll just start with one ounce of coffee, whatever your preferred bean is, whatever you mess around with those flavor profiles, pick the roast you want. Um, and again, the grind size is so important. And so it's going to be that medium size, she said, but for your eye to see, it's close to like what sea salt looks like is what you're looking for. Um, for about for a 20 ounce coffee, you'll start with 20 ounces of, of hot water. You're going to want to boil that to around 205 to 210 degrees. It doesn't have to be exact. I think our water is always at like 208, mm -hmm. um, but it is just helpful to make sure you don't go over that 210 because you can kind of get that burnt taste in your coffee then. Um, it is from start to finish going to take about two minutes to brew this coffee, but it is a precise pour and so you'll start by putting those grounds in a paper filter and then inside of a pour over, which I don't know if you guys have seen that before, it just looks like a flat little fat. It's like a cone. Yeah, it looks like an ice cream cone, but it's squashed a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna put it over your cup or your mug at home. You'll do your first pour and you wanna start from the middle of the coffee grounds and work your way out. And that first pour is actually called a bloom. And you'll watch your grounds, they'll actually kind of puff up and look like they're blooming. They'll bubble a little bit, it smells delicious, and you wanna let it do that for at least 15 to 30 seconds. And then you'll do your second pour again from the middle, working out. And then you just want to make sure the grounds kind of consistently stay wet. And you do that until you get your full 20 ounces poured. And you'll have a full cup of coffee. So if you want a fancy cup at home, that's our suggestion. The easiest way yeah. to do it, honestly. And I mean, we're going to touch on this too. Coffee is a lot about the experience. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like a pour over gives you that experience because you're actually taking the time to watch it and to you know do it the proper way it's a fun one I mean, yeah anytime anyone orders one at the shop i'm like you, you feel fancy you yeah know, i make coffee all day every day i just feel like i feel really fancy when yeah I make yeah <laughs> so this is the second component we think of a perfect cup which is um the setting i arguably would say this is the most important part of a perfect cup of coffee um so coffee you know originated the whole goal of a coffee house in general was to bring people together and have connection, right? Over a cup of coffee. And I think, you know, this is why it's the most important is because a cup of coffee can actually really, really bring people together. And it just allows you to, you know, inspire one another and to create great ideas. And I feel like that's why we're where we are today is because of coffee. I'm just saying. <laughs> But coffee really is about an experience. So I just want to like charge all of you that whether it's like you, you make a cool little coffee bar at home or you go to a coffee shop, hint, hint, just make it like actually be your safe space and like, you know, somewhere that you can like take a breath, you know, take a sip and actually just root yourself in your day.
And so the third component is company. Um, I would without a doubt say that coffee has enriched my life and yours. Um, coffee is where I have met some of my all-time favorite people in the world, my family, and it is just some of my favorite experiences. So I don't know, I would just tell you all that allow coffee to be something more than just a way to get your caffeine for the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that is a lot for a lot of people. I mean, it is for me too. Like, I mean, I can't survive without it. Yeah. But it is just, just even hearing Tyler talk about the whole process before it even reaches your house or reaches your coffee shop, it's a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, even before it reaches Tyler, it's been grown in these different countries and people work really, really hard for it. And so, you know, once it gets to you, that's the end of the process, right? So like you're kind of the one like bringing it home. You're like the final show. Yeah, and you're like the final act. So like, you know, take that for what it is. It's like really important and it, you know, it has a lot. Yeah, I think like coffee too, it seems so simple. Like it seems like it's just a cup of coffee, but like I personally, I just remember this like in this moment, but there's so many memories around it. Like I did online school and so like, when I technically graduated college, I was sitting in a coffee shop drinking a coffee. Yeah, like, like it's just it's it's a small thing, but it's like can be tied to so many memories. And I just think that's really cool. And like I think we can all agree as like humans, like we thrive in connection. Mm -hmm. And so I always like to think of my cup of coffee as like an opportunity to have that connection. And so like whether it's taking the five minutes take it takes to make your coffee at home to sit down and look at your kid before you send them off to school and see how they're doing or tell your spouse you love them or call your mom really quick or if you're going out to a coffee shop in the morning like just look at the person behind you and ask how their day's going or just yeah. smile it's like it's such an opportunity to just like make a difference in someone's life and like I guarantee you it'll make a difference in your life too yeah so well I just wanted to end with this quote really quick because it's not like a famous author or anything it's kind of funny it's actually from someone where we source our coffee from um, her name's Nora, and I think she's awesome. She's like been to these like barista competitions and have like won. She's like won the like cupping competition. She's really cool. But um, she actually said this at one of her presentations, and it like really stuck with me. Um, it says we have an opportunity each day to make not only the people in our immediate circles feel seen and heard, but to connect to humanity in an incredibly impactful way. Coffee is the great equalizer. That's all we got for you. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> but that's how to get a hold of us. That's where we're located in Rooted Coffee. We have Facebook, Instagram. We also have TikTok if you guys want to watch on TikTok. <laughs> we have a lot of fun with our social media. Yeah. So we, like, we do. Follow us if you want. Yes. What are your hours? Our hours, yes. Um, we probably are about to extend them, so watch Facebook. That's like. Facebook, that's why I would urge you guys to follow us because that's where a lot of our information is going to go out. But right now we are open um, Monday, Thursday, Friday from 6 a.m. to noon, Saturday, Sunday from 7 a.m. to noon. Um, we're planning on extending those like as it gets warmer and we get busier and things like that. We'll probably have like longer hours going in the evening a little bit more. But yeah, so the only days we're closed right now is Tuesday and Wednesday. Do you have any idea how deep you want to go in the evening? Ooh, I mean, oh. here's the deal. So we have, we fixed up our backyard, and which I'm like really excited about, and we got like fun chairs and lights and like, so we would love to like have an evening crowd, you know? Yeah, but it is just us. Yeah. So like, <laughs> and, and we like bake, like all of our stuff is homemade and from scratch, so we're already there like super early in the morning, so we'd be pulling like 20 hour days. Yeah. So, I, so I mean, we'll like adjust it as the summer goes on, but yeah. even looking at doing like at least maybe an evening once a weekend or yeah. Yeah. something like that. At least that. on the weekends go a little bit later, yeah. even if like, you know how Oliver's across the street, they like close a little bit and then open back up. So maybe we do something like that where we would like close a couple hours, let ourselves rest, come back for a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. That's that. Any other questions? What did you major in in college? Uh yeah, I actually majored in marketing. Um so that's why I have a lot of fun with our social media because that is what I went to college for. <laughs> and so it actually helps a lot, I think. It is really fun. Yeah. Because you actually had a marketing job, which was like really fun, but mm -hmm. to get to actually use it on something you're passionate about mm -hmm. is really cool too. Yeah. I got a liberal arts degree, but did a lot of internships also kind of in like the marketing, um, like arts 
photography area. So. Yeah. We both, we ended up after college, we moved to Colorado and we got, we worked at a marketing agency. And I, I enjoyed it, but it was just one of those things where I was like, this isn't my passion, you know? Like I wasn't, I wasn't able to like super get into, you know, doing marketing for like a roofing company or something. You know? <laughs> I don't know if I can like passionately sell this right now. So it like actually works out that like coffee is my passion and it has been since college. Like I started working at a coffee shop my freshman year of college and I fell in love with it. Yes, I fell in love with it. And I was like, not only coffee itself and like the whole process, but just the environment of a coffee house and like how it brings people together and everything you can experience. Like, so it's really easy for me to sell. So it's nice that <laughs> that is, that's what we got to do, so. Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Farmington actually, so. I grew up in Iowa. Okay, oh, that's part of <laughs> um, Do you know Mason City? It's like, it's north of Des Moines, like two hours. So I'm pretty close to the Minnesota border, actually. And sometimes I get a little bit of the northern accent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you say bagel. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. What's up? What, what kind of roast is your drip? Yeah. Good question. So our drip is actually in Ethiopia, and it is like a lighter roast. And so that's why um, it does, you were talking about how you can like taste color. Mm -hmm. It's funny because the, where we get our coffee from, they, their primary roasts, they like named them colors and like ours is red. And so like you kind of, with our drip coffee, you kind of taste that you red. You taste the like cherry. Fruity, 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 yeah, yeah, flavor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that's with our, our cold brew actually is more mm -hmm. of the like chocolatey, mm -hmm. They named it blue. It's more of that like kind of you know sweeter, sweeter taste. Have you tried nitro brew? Yes, yes, I have. I actually know nothing about it though. I um, yeah, it's so good. Yeah, Starbucks does it. I um I don't know how to brew it though. So it's similar to cold brew. Yeah, but yeah, I, we haven't gotten into that mm -hmm. yet. But just the yeah. yeah. You like it though? Yes. Yeah. Not as a not as an always. Mm -hmm. But just as it's a, strong, I know that. Yeah, it it like makes though. my yeah. heart tick. It'll get you going, <laughs> It'll get you going for the day, okay. that's for sure. <laughs> it works about one o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm going to do a little shameless plug. If anyone likes cold coffee, I will say we have we take pride in our cold brew mm. and we've started doing sweet cream cold foams, which is like a really just smooth, creamy, sweet foam you can put on top of it. It's great mm. for summer and spring. And we just got new spring flavors. Yeah, so just gonna plug that in there. If you're yeah. looking for a nice, fun spring coffee, you should yeah. come on by. They have blackberry. Blackberry. Yeah. Blackberry, yeah. blackberry is the new one. We're gonna have a couple. Just, you know, I have a hard time with cold coffee. Coffee should be hot. I know. I have a lot of people that say that. I haven't really tried it, so I'm like, nitro is just like, I don't know. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's the thing. And that's what's fun about it. all that sweet stuff in my coffee. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, like Tyler was saying, that's what's fun about it, is it's like so individualized, you know? It's all in how you like it, and there's nothing wrong with it, you know? Like, it's literally like, you like your coffee black, that's awesome. You like it as sweet as it can be, that's awesome, you know? Like, that's what's, that's what's great about coffee, is it's just about your individual experience. I'm like with Tyler, too. I think some people, like, hear that we own a coffee shop, and they're like, you must only drink black coffee. And I'm like, <laughs> honestly, I mean, I don't lie, I do sometimes. But sometimes I'm like, give me like the creamy, like, yeah. serious <laughs> mocha I can have. Yeah. You know, I'll go both ways, just mm -hmm. depending on the day, or the mood, or the setting that I'm in. Yeah, so. exactly. Do you guys actually do espressos? Mm -hmm. We do. Yeah. So we have we have uh, you know lattes, cappuccinos. We have all the espresso drinks. Um, so with our hot I've drinks, had your lattes, but you did a pour over. The coffee, I thought. So that, yeah. Had, uh, well, so that's actually an AeroPress. So oh, it looks yeah. it looks kind of similar to a uh, okay. um, pour over. So we don't have like an actual espresso machine because those are very expensive. Like a commercial espresso machine, we'll get there one day. But um, we actually do an AeroPress shot, and so it's it's very similar to what you would get out of an espresso machine. It's just manual instead okay. of you know. And so it's the same thing, you know, same grind size. You just you know, you pour hot water over it and you, you, you 
guys have all seen us, you know, pushing our yeah. our whole weight down on it, like we have sore wrists at the it's end really of the day. It's really like the same great taste for you, just a lot more work for us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yep. That's what I like. Well, I want to <laughs> yep. That's right. Now, what's the difference between like the pour over and a French press? Mm. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I've had a French press, but I always had so many extra parts floating around that I quit using. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> obviously. That had to do with the grind size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, a pour over is, you know, the process of literally pouring hot water over the grounds and it dripping through that yeah. way. It's like a drain to drain. Mm -hmm. It drains through this. And um, a French press is almost it's more like an arrow press in the sense that it is, the instead of, you know, just pouring the hot water over the grounds, you are actually like extracting the flavor by pushing those notes through. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's yeah. gonna like the grounds are gonna just sit in hot water for a, like for a while. There you'll mm -hmm. have you'll set a timer and everything, and so that's how the grinds just soak in hot water for a while, and then you push it down. Mm -hmm. Whereas a, a pour over is just it's just gonna drip through them and just go straight from the cup. Yeah. So it's just a different way to extract it, and it give you a little bit of different flavor. I personally like pour over more than French press. Mm -hmm. I didn't like pour-overs. I, I never went <laughs> to a coffee shop, so I did the opposite. That was like a pretty like fancy coffee shop, but they didn't do pour-overs and they did French presses. Yeah. So it's, there's so much just personal preference in yeah. coffee to show. Yep. It was an easier way to do one or two cups for myself mm -hmm. instead of having an electric, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, a percolator. I haven't heard of that for a long yeah. time. What is it? It was percolator. called a percolator. You basically, you put your coffee in a little basket on the top. You put it in the water, percolated over the top. It got yeah. boiling and it percolated over the top. And so the little thing at the top, it would yeah. bubble up and it would change color. And when it got the color you wanted, then you yeah. turned it off. And you awesome. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, sure. yeah. Right age, but I knew because I had to make it for my yeah. church yeah. dinner. Yeah, yeah. 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 we had small at home, but yeah, the church dinner was a yeah. big, yeah. big yeah. 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 That's funny for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 church that does dinners, they got this thing about this big, the bath is about that big, and you pour like five cups of grounds in it. Yeah. Let it go. Huh. <laughs> Tyler, I have a question for you. Do you, I'm, so you sell beans, which yep. I was unaware of. Do you sell grinded coffee too? I do. I can grind it. I have a grinder as well too. I always encourage people to, you know, if you if you want to get into specialty coffee and if you like specialty coffee, spend forty bucks on a grinder, and then you'll have specialty coffee forever. So, um, so I, I will grind it, uh, but I always encourage people to get a grinder. So there's there's typically two different types of grinders as well too. So there's like the spice grinder or the blade grinder, which looks like a blender, mm -hmm. um, which that works if that's what you got, that'll work. Um, but it's not going to be a very consistent grind. And then the second grinder is a burr grinder. So the 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 coffee is ground in between two metal plates, and once it reaches the right size, it drops out. So it'll be super consistent. Um, so I always say spend 40, 50 bucks on a burr grinder, and you're good to go. What do you think about instant coffee versus? Whoa. Right? <laughs> like nowadays, you, I mean, the coffee aisle is like two huge. aisles. Yeah, it's huge when you go look at coffee. Yeah. You know, there's so many options. Yeah. You can buy like, get it from me. Yeah. Senka. <laughs> um, I think just like what you were talking about, you know how you were talking about the comp comparison of like, uh, I can't remember the names of them, but how, you know, like one is like a lot faster to make. Yeah, like and, the Robusta. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah. like, but it's just less, it's like lower it's quality. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's the same thing with anything. Like you're not going to get as good of a cheeseburger from McDonald's as you would Ciro's, you mm -hmm. know, and it's because it's the complete difference on how fast they make it and how many they're making. And so I, would, I mean, I would say that's probably like a lot of those instant coffees is it's just mass production of as fast it's as you can be make mass it. produced and then brewed atypically. <laughs> yeah. you know, so it's I mean, it looks so much different even when you make it. Yeah. I, uh, the colors yeah. of the coffee are so. I lived in Malaysia for a little bit, and at my little hotel every morning would give me. They didn't have regular coffee brewed, but they had instant packets. And never in my life had I ever drank instant coffee.
healthy, but I did there because it was my only option. Yeah. I can't say I yes. ever fell in love with it. <laughs> No, so, so there's like the you know the standard the standard uh, Maxwell House and Folgers instant coffee, which is I don't even know how they make it, but I would imagine there's a couple chemicals involved. But then there's then there's like Starbucks has their their what's the what's it called the it begins with a V. It's like an espresso powder. Yeah, yeah it's Vienna like a powder. Or something, yeah. So that's just actually micro grind ground coffee. Oh, so that's okay. there's not a whole lot of of processing that goes into it, and then the the it's coffee okay. will you know disintegrate in water. Mm -hmm. That's that's a little different than standard, you know, mass produced uh um um which is instant coffee. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. All right. Thank you guys for coming.